So let me start by using a quote written by Christian Cajo. He's one of the most powerful photo curators today in the French-speaking world. And in 2008, with the help of the French Cultural Centre, he organised the first edition of Photo Nom Pen. With the addition of this festival, Cambodia becomes the only country in Southeast Asia and South Asia to have two annual photo festivals. The other one is Angkor Photo Festival, founded towards the end of 2005. So here is an extract of Kajol's text. He, he basically says that 15 years ago, photography was virtually absent uh, from Phnom Penh, especially in its cultural and creative dimension. Local production was limited to what is called applied photography, intended for the press or for postcards. It was at Tluseng, with its unbearable portraits that one saw Cambodian photography. And then he started talking about Angkor Photo Festival and how they promote photography among young Cambodians. And then he notes that some of these young photographers have quickly moved beyond photojournalism. Now Cambodian contemporary photography exists and shows a great diversity. Now there is some truth in his observation, but his account is also too linear and poses obvious problems. First, he does not tell us what is contemporary photography in Cambodia. And yet, his account of Cambodian photography implies that photojournalism is inferior to contemporary photography, or that contemporary photography can only come about at a more advanced stage, and that it is some higher form of photography that only certain people can aspire to. Actually, the usage of these hazily defined labels like photojournalism, conceptual photography, art photography, etc., etc., is quite prevalent in Southeast Asia. Not only does it have real implications on the ways we write the histories of photography here, it also allows curators and galleries to suppress certain kinds of photography. Now, in my research, I use the term independent photography to bypass these labels, shifting the focus back to the photographers. So for now, I have limited my research questions to artists who use the medium for non-commissioned work. If we think about the linearity of Christian Kajol's account, it fits the so-called historiography of photography in Southeast Asia, that the medium arrived from the West and took root with Euro-American help. In other words, it privileges the influence of Western photography. And the real irony is that today, the people who claim to promote Southeast Asian photography also use such a linear account. So of course, photographic technology arrived from the West and that white male photographers played an important role in that transfer. However, the process of that transfer and how photography has been adapted in different parts of Southeast Asia is a lot more complex. So in Cambodia, there was indeed a rupture in the development of the arts caused by the turmoil leading to the 1970 coup that deposed Sihanouk, the American bombings from 1964 to 1975, the Khmer Rouge takeover 1975 to 1979, and then the subsequent Vietnamese rule. Only in 1989 did the Vietnamese army started withdrawing from Cambodia. And so when we look at someone like Heng Sinif, right, who picked up photography in the 90s, he was not trying to be Henry Cartier-Bresson or Robert Frank, you know. Um, Sinif was actually for several years working as a coolie. And then in um, 1993, he brought a practical camera for US $150. And his friend taught him how to load negatives and take pictures. And then he started taking pictures of local tourists in front of the royal palace. At the end of the year, without knowing even how to conduct an interview, he was employed as a journalist and a photographer for a local newspaper. Sinif and Mark Remisa, both of whom featured in my show, belong to this first generation of uh, photographers. And I use first with, you know, with inverted commas, in the sense that they are the ones that emerged, the first that emerged in the 90s. And it's the same for Ratana, who is also featured in my show. He did not learn photography in any kind of formalistic way. Ratana belongs to the second generation of photographers who picked up the medium before the proliferation of digital technology. And the third generation, as I call them, emerged after, 19, after 2007. And some of them are featured here, including, Som, including Somnang, Lim Sokchan Lina, Heng Ravut, and Sovan Pilong. So let's I, I want to tell you a story about 
uh, Ratana, when he was growing up in the 80s, right, um, there were hardly any books in Cambodia at that time. So Ratana's early source of images were not photography but movies. In the 90s, he probably watched about 100 Bollywood and Indian movies. And so what I'm saying here is that for many of the Cambodian photographers, right, their encounter with art or Western photography is almost always a mediated process, limited by access. And this is actually not unique to Cambodia, except that it is very obvious because of the truncation of politics. So in this presentation, I want to quickly highlight four references that we know that we now have in order to challenge the narrative offered by Christian Kajo. So the method here is quite important. I want to look at the kind of photographies being produced before 1980s in Cambodia to understand the conditions that affected the production and then the themes that these photographers addressed and then to see if there are similarities with the photographers who emerged in the 90s. So first, we have to talk about this book. It's called Culture of Independence and Introduction to Cambodian Arts and Culture in the 1950s and 1960s. So this is widely seen as the foundation text on modern Cambodian art. So there's no dedicated chapter on photography, right? But on, in the chapter on painting, we learn of the Japanese painter Suzuki, who had by 1948 set up a modern painting department at the School of Cambodian Arts. So many of his students would become the first modern painters of Cambodia. Suzuki forbade his students from using photography as a source material for their paintings. Instead, he emphasized the importance of drawing from direct observation. According to Suzuki, paint photography is not natural. The photograph is like a mirror that pulls everything in, and everything is clear within the frame. To him, people would look at a really good photograph for a minute, and they wouldn't look at it anymore. Nevertheless, many of his students would still use photography after graduation, to help their painting practices. I think it is fair to say that even in the 1950s, the painters of the school were already deliberating over the function and limits of photography. In the book itself, right, there is also a chapter on the heyday of Cambodian cinema from the mid-60s to the early 1970s. In the chapter, we learn of Cambodian filmmakers who also did photography. As a student, even before he made his first film, right, Lee Boon Kim, was already taking landscape photographs and selling them to tourists at his friend's bookshop. He learned how to develop film from a French manual and even figured out a way to make colour prints. Now, this is a poster of one of his most popular movies in the 1960s. It's called Kimir's After Angkor. Now, if you look at this image, right, you can easily call it a photographic work. You know, it's, it's a montage of photographic portraits and the effect is quite Stunning, actually. So what's the point of talking about painters and filmmakers in the 50s and 60s? Actually, they were faced with the same challenge at the same time, at that time, which is whether the role of Cambodian art was to entertain or to critique society. And the question is still relevant today, especially for Cambodian photographers in the last decade or so. At least for some of them, there's a strong desire to tell stories from within, to reflect upon the histories, cultural norms and ways of life which are now rapidly being transformed in Cambodia. In rapt future, Lim Sokchan Lina photographs the boards and barricades that block off the construction sites in Phnom Penh as a metaphor for the uncertain future of the city. In Untitled, Somnang uses his body to mark the privatisation and filling in with sand of the public lakes in Phnom Penh. From the perspective of the government and the developers, the idea is to turn this newly created land into commercial property. Apart from the impact on the environment, residents by these lakes have been evicted without proper compensation. In the last two decades, this is probably the first photo project that has taken a critical stand on a specific his, uh, issue. Only in the photographic practice of Mark Remisa is there a conscious desire to entertain his viewers on a visual level. The striking use of colours in Water is Life serves to draw his audience towards the importance of protecting our water resources. Now, the second source of reference comes from this 1997 book edited by Horse Fast and Tim Page, 
titled Requiem by the photographers who died in Vietnam and Indochina. From the book, we learn of Cambodian photographers like Diet Pran or T. Kim Hien, who worked for Western media agencies documenting the conflict right up to the Khmer Rouge takeover in 1975. Now, unlike the Vietnam War across the border, the conflict in Cambodia was a lot more dangerous to cover. This is the first modern conflict where almost every journalist, cameraman, photographer who fell into the hands of the Khmer Rouge was killed. In fact, Western news agency banned their photographers from going out into the field. That's why they paid Cambodians very little money to cover the conflict for them. So there's money to be made. But some of the photographers persisted because they truly believed that their work would convince other countries to act before the Khmer Rouge take over. Others use it as a weapon against the corruption of the Long Noh government, which was supported by America. So I think this desire to record, to document, is still shared by some of the current photographers like Vandi Ratana. I have to quote uh, from Erin Gleason, who is a specialist of uh, Cambodian arts, and she basically said that the photographs taken in Cambodia today revolve around the themes of tempers and trauma. These cliches leave much of Cambodia unrepresented. So Ratana is unique because he's the first to situate his practice beyond aesthetics concerns or the confines of press photography. His first work actually was titled Looking In and is situated within an existentialistic framework. So he explains, what details make us Cambodian? I want to review the internal to archive Cambodia as much as I can. It's not for me. We have to tell the world who we are. So what Ratana did was to photograph his immediate environment, like his family and other Cambodian homes. He also photographed the telecoms company where he used to work. So part of the motivation here is to collect these photographic details to reconstruct the visual heritage of Cambodia, which had been partially lost in the 1970s and 1980s. The third reference is a book um, that's published in 2010 by Joel Montage. It's, uh, the title of the book is called Picture Postcards of Cambodia, 1900s to 1950. And from these picture postcards, we have an early source of photographic portraiture in Cambodia. Of course, most of the photographers who made these images, right, were presumably white and French, or French. And you have to keep in mind that the decision to publish certain postcards was shaped by ideological, commercial, and religious considerations. But this doesn't mean that we cannot make useful comments about the nature of photography in Cambodia from these picture postcards. And the author made many observations. Some of them are still valid even today. It seems that the Cambodian royal family had a very interesting and easy relationship with the photographers of the colonial era. And popular with the French public, the King Sisowat in particular was uh, featured in many, many of the postcards. And compared to the monarchy, there were fewer colonial postcards of ordinary Cambodians, and there were fewer postcards of men than women. According to the author, the men and boys were usually photographed in a straightforward and manly way. Now, female nudity was rare, but this is not the case in Java at the same time period. New underage girls actually appeared in quite a lot of studio portraits, and these photographs were actually popular and sold for a lot of money in the West. So among the photographers who emerged in the last decade, <coughs> Heng Ravouf often uses the human body as his subject matter. And in the new series, right, he presents a series of naked self-portraits to counter the cultural norm of treating nudity with shamefulness or embarrassment. And he also gives the male body a kind of sensuality that is quite rare in Cambodian photography. Of course, the fourth reference is the massive archive of mug shots found at the S21 Torture Center, known today as the Tlusang Museum of Genocidal Crimes. The mug shots were taken immediately upon arrival, and some writers have argued that the production of these portraits was part of an apparatus to intimidate the prisoners. According to cultural geographer Rachel Hughes, right, the S21 mug shots have become the undisciplined envoys of Cambodia's traumatic past, circulating on a global scale and through various media. 
Now, I think in this sense, it is hard to avoid their imprint when we look at something like Sovan Pilong's computer light portraits, where he invited uh, his subjects to stand in front of the computer and lead them up using the computer screen and then photograph them. But, you know, actually the series is not really about the Khmer Rouge and the work has more to do with Pilong's fascination with light. So is Rachel Hughes' idea quite far-fetched? I don't think so. Let me show you this work, which is a reminder. An earlier work by Somnang. He was actually then working as an art teacher two hours away from Phnom Penh. And one day he was asked to take ID photos of his students. When the students saw the portraits, right, the students told him that they looked like prisoners. So why did they respond in this way, actually? And why in Cambodia? You know, an ID photograph is the most generic kind of photograph that we can ever make. That's why I think it is fair to suggest that the S21 mug shops continue to loom in the minds of young Cambodians, even though their understanding of the Khmer Rouge history is almost always informed by memories of family members. And it is the work of Heng Sinif um, which contributes to our understanding of the Khmer Rouge history. And today the tendency is to oversimplify the history and to see them as one humo uh, homogeneous group of people with a thirst of violence. But in fact, many of his junior and mid-level comrades were recruited as children and forced to be slaves of the revolution. As many as one-third of the S21 staff were actually killed between 1975 to 1979 during the purges. And the photographers who make the mark shots also took ID photographs of the comrades. So in this work, Sinif would use the ID photographs taken in the 70s, track down the S21 staff now, and photograph them as villagers and spouses. Today, many of them are very poor. And uh, Sinif is not trying to normalize the cruelty of the Khmer Rouge. He's just asking for a more nuanced understanding of the history. So in, clo in closing, the boundaries that past photographers faced prior to the 1980s the themes that they addressed and the approaches that they adopted continue to inform the Cambodian photographers now. Hopefully, with these four references, we will be able to talk about Cambodian photography in a more comprehensive way. Thanks. <laughs>